My topic this afternoon is the office of bishop. And I took that topic from the uh, first chapter of 1 Timothy, the, the third chapter of 1 Timothy, verse 1, where it says, This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, I'm very much aware that we don't address each other as bishop. I thought about saying, thank you, Bishop Hicks. (laughs) And I could have done that, and it would have been accurate. It would have been accurate. But normally, we don't address each other as bishop. There may be more than one reason why that we don't. But one of the reasons is that uh, uh, there are some religious groups that misuse the title bishop um, in an unscriptural uh, way in which their clergy is ranked some above the others according to status or authority. Now, we don't rank each other one higher than the other. We stand here as equals. We've been saved by the grace of God. We belong to God's family. We have been given a call to the ministry. And uh, some of us have been ordained. Some have not. Some have a lot of more experience than others. Some are pastors of churches and others are not. But we are equal in the eyes of God. And so we address each other as brothers. We're brothers in the Lord. We also address each other, those who have been ordained as elders. uh, Because uh, they have been examined uh, from a doctrinal standpoint, have been found to be sound in the faith, and have been um, initiated uh, as uh, sound biblical um, preachers in Baptist doctrine. And, and have been so, uh, and they have been indicated as such by the imposition of hands. We've laid our hands on each other. And therefore, we are, we recognize each other as elders. Now, I don't know if that's a good definition or not, but that's the way I see it. Now, <clears throat> The word bishop comes from the Greek word episcopi and means overseer. It has reference to a scripturally ordained preacher, and I have emphasized a man who has been called to serve as a pastor of a local church. Now, um, those that are ordained are recognized as elders. Uh, If you do not have a church, if you're not pastoring a church, you are not a bishop, according to the Scripture. Uh, A bishop is an overseer over a local congregation 
of baptized believers. And um, so that's the way that I understand uh, and what I believe the Bible to teach. Now, the office, our title is the office of bishop. And the office has reference to the position, uh, not ecclesiastical authority. I said we're equal one with another. But uh, the position or the office um, uh, of a bishop uh, is uh, as an overseer uh, is what entitles uh, a person to be called a bishop. Um, a scriptural pastor is a servant of a church and not a boss. Amen. Amen. He is subject to the church. The church has total and complete authority over him. Whatever he does, he does by the authority of the church if it's scriptural. Now, we may do some things, you know, that, uh, are, that is not scriptural. Well, that don't count if we do. <laughs> the church is, is, uh, has authority over us. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul included among the gifts that Christ gave to the church, pastors and teachers. And I understand that pastors and teachers are the same person. Um. The word pastor comes from the Greek word pronounced uh, poimen and was translated shepherd 18 times in the scriptures. And the word teacher was, was translated from the word diaskalos and means instructors. So, Pastors are shepherds, and they're also teachers, instructors. And um, so I won't go any further with that. But I want us to look at the Great Commission for a few minutes. Um, Jesus, after he had risen from the dead, he told, uh, sent word for the apostles to meet him on a mountain in Galilee that he had previously uh, uh, appointed. And uh, when they met together, the Lord Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Or I might have said that backwards. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. It means the same thing, don't it? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And he said that teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Now I want to... Uh, read the definition here of all power. He said all power. He didn't say some power. He said all power. And I looked that up, and the word that is translated power uh, is uh, pronounced exosia, um, E-X-O-O-C-E-E-S-E-E-A-H. I'm not good at pronouncing these words, so you had to bear with me. But this is what it means. Ability. He's saying all power. Now, this is what is given unto him that is 
included and covered by the word uh, power, ability, uh, privilege, capacity, um, um, freedom. Uh, dedicated authority, jurisdiction, liberty, and right. Now, when Jesus said, all power is given to me, all of those things were included under that one word, power. Amen. He had all power. Amen. He has all power. Amen. And so having those qualifications, he said, go ye therefore and teach. Teach. He said, teach all nations. He told uh, uh, the church just before he ascended back to heaven, he said, begin at Jerusalem, go to uh, Samaria. He said, go to the uttermost parts of the earth. There's a good reason for that. There's power in the gospel and in the word of God. And so uh, he said, I am giving you authority to go and teach my word. Now he emphasizes that uh, when he said, Teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. In other words, he said, you go, you teach, and you teach the same thing that I taught. And I believe today that that's, we have that same authority to preach the very same Gospel that the Lord Jesus preached. Amen. And anywhere in the world. Now, uh, so the purpose of the church is to teach. That's the purpose of it, to teach. And it said, To teach is to inform and instruct. Inform and instruct. Where do you get your information? You get it out of the Word of God. Amen. That's the source of our information that we are to preach and to teach. And we are to inform and instruct lost people. People that are on their way to hell, Brother Curtis. They need to hear how to be saved. Amen. You can preach all day that if you die in your sins, you're going to hell. But if you don't inform them on how to be saved, they're not going to know how. And so we too are to inform and instruct the lost. But not only that, we are to educate those who have been saved on the way of righteous living. That's our commission. That's what we're supposed to do. 
Now, most of our churches, we have auxiliaries such as Sunday school, Bible study, prayer meetings, and they are profitable and beneficial. They are supplementary. Uh, They are support to the work of preaching the gospel. And uh, I believe, and you don't have to believe what I said. I told you I'm not authority on anything. But I do believe that the best way of communicating Bible truth is through anointed preaching. And when I say anointed preaching, I mean spiritual preaching, preaching uh, under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And that's the best way. And that's the example in the Bible. Now, there were some people that taught other people privately, and I'm not saying a thing in the world against that. If you have the opportunity and you have the leadership of the Holy Spirit to talk to somebody, talk to them. But if you don't have the leadership from God, leave them alone. You'll do more harm than you will good. Now, that's my opinion. I feel safe. I can back it up by the word of God. But anyway, why is that the best way? Well, because that's God's plan. You know, we're told and the the church is told, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. We're supposed to gather together and worship the Lord. And uh, the gospel is preached. That's the example that's given in the Bible. That's the example that is given by the Lord Jesus. He called unto them his disciples. They assembled together and he taught them. We read in the Bible, you know, about the, the apostle Paul going on missionary journeys And the people would assemble together and he would uh, preach unto them. So I think that's the the best way to do it. But I said, and I want to say it again. If you have the opportunity to do uh, talk to somebody privately and God gives you the leadership to do it, don't you fail to do it. Now, I believe that the office of bishop or pastor is the most important office in the land. I believe it is more important than any office, political, religious, whatever kind of office it is, there is none that is more important than the office of a pastor. I want to ask this question right at this time, if I may. Um, How many God-called preachers are there in this building? (laughs) See your hand. Huh. I don't see anybody that didn't raise their hand. That's what I was expecting. But now I'm going to ask this question. How many pastors are there in the building? You're a pastor of a church. All right. Thank you. Now I'm going to ask, how many ordained preachers are there in the building that are not pastors? Now, let's see your hands. There are quite a few. Now I'm going to ask this question. How many God-called preachers are in this building that have not yet been ordained. Let's see your hand. Oh, look at there. 
There's a lot of them out there. <laughs> My dear friend, I want to tell you something. You are my target for today. You're the one that I want to talk to more than anybody else. Uh, it's a great honor to be ordained to the full work of the ministry. It is a great honor. And uh, I hope that someday every one of you will have the privilege and the honor of having your, your brethren come around and lay their hands on you and say, I've got confidence in you. I believe what you said when you said you was called to preach. <laughs> I believe that you are sound in the faith. I believe you believe the word of God. And therefore, we're going to set you apart as a qualified person to pastor a church. Qualified the pastor. Now, some of you may not understand what I've said or what I've done. I hope you do. But a pastor is really important. The office, I said, is the most important. And the, the uh, office of a pastor is a very demanding office. If you've been called to pastor a church, don't take it lightly. I was working in Indianapolis 1967. We just closed out a revival at Bethel Church. And... uh, the deacons came over to my house and said, Preacher, we want to know on behalf of the church if you are willing to quit work and pastor our church full time. I had a car payment and a house payment and two kids and uh, uh, I prayed about it, and the Lord told me that that's what I ought to do. I have never regretted it. Never for one minute have I regretted. And uh, I'm not bragging. I hope you know that. I'm not bragging in any way. I pastored several churches and every one of them I've been a full-time pastor that I've pastored. And uh, I, I said that being a pastor is a demanding job. People expect something out of you. They expect you to study the Word of God. They expect you to be prepared you know, it breaks my heart to see a preacher walk into the pulpit and say, I don't have anything to preach on. He got a holy Bible, 66 books. The very thing that the Lord commands that we preach and teach in our hands, and we say, I don't have anything to preach. You may think I'm being too hard on you. I'm not. I'm not. Listen, it has the greatest responsibility. You won't have any kind of a job that has a greater responsibility than pastor the Lord's church. 
And there is accountability. You are accountable to that church. But more than that, you're accountable to the one that the church belongs to. The Lord Jesus. Now listen to what the Bible says. It says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. We're responsible for handling the Word of God. (laughs) And you said, moreover, in addition to that, it is required. I didn't make that up. It's in the book. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. First Corinthians four verses one and two. Now I'm I'm not teaching this lesson today because I think I'm a good example. And God knows I'm telling you the truth. There are lots of brethren that are far better example of being a good pastor than I am. But listen. I'm not trying to criticize anybody. That's not my objective. I'm not trying to chastise anybody. That's completely out of my uh, hands. The Bible says, and this is the word of God, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I'm going to tell you, it's not proper for a pastor to get in the pulpit and criticize the members of the church. Nor is it proper for him uh, to try to chastise them. The Bible says, the Lord says, that it chastisement belongs to me, saith the Lord. And if you get out of the will of God, he'll chastise you if you're his child. You can count on it. He said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. It's not the pastor's job to criticize and chastise. We're responsible to God, and we are responsible also to the church. Now, I want to get this in. It's important. We're not prophets. And we are not apostles. We do not have direct uh, inspiration. We do have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us and direct us. In the Word of God. It'll help us to understand the Word of God. But God is not giving any new revelations to anybody. Not any. The written Word is the revealed mind and Word of the living God. It is. And the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, uh, uh, for instruction, uh, and is 
so that all will be furnished under all good works. Now, I used to go quote that. And I could turn and read it right now. But listen, I'm telling you, the Bible is the inspired word of God. And he's not changed his mind about anything since it was written. And he's not going to change his mind about anything. The, the Holy Spirit will lead us and help us to understand. The Holy Spirit, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and then we have the Holy Spirit upon us. Jesus said to his church, now you tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he also said, when the Holy Spirit is given unto you, he will direct you into all truth. Now, you may labor for a long time over a passage of Scripture, you know, wonder, you know, and you may th think, you know, I just have no idea what that means. And you just keep on reading it and praying about it. And someday the Lord will probably show you what it means. Now, he can do that. Amen. He can do that. I've got to hurry. So I'm going to go on. Now, God has provided us with textbooks. Textbooks. The, called the pastoral epistles. First and second Timothy and Titus. They're written by an apostle to pastors. Timothy was a pastor and Titus was a pastor and Paul was an apostle. And he wrote to them. Uh, and uh, so the information uh, that we need, we can find in these books. Uh, they contain information about conduct, about behavior, also instructions on preaching and preparing to preach. You say, I don't believe in preparing to preach. Shame on you. Amen. I'm not being ugly. I don't mean to be. I'm... Speaking to you in love. You need to study, study, study. You need to pray, pray, pray. And I know from experience as well as from what the Bible says, the Lord will direct your paths. He'll direct us on preparing to preach and what to preach. These books emphasize the importance of study. Study to show yourself approved unto men. No, no. We're not trying to please men. We're trying to please God. And God knows what your congregations need. He knows what is needed every service. Amen. And he would have called you and put you in place if he was going to abandon you. Amen. He will not abandon you. Amen. Now, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what that means? Putting every portion of it in the right place. Just like a jigsaw puzzle or, a, you know, uh, every piece has got its place. You can't, you can't put them in the wrong place. It won't work. So, Now, this is my statement. I want you to listen to it. God supplies 
the content for our preaching. The content. But me and you are responsible for the manner in which we deliver it. Now, we are to keep on being examples. You know, the Bible is to be an example. So, we are to keep on being an example. Not just start out being an example, but keep on being an example. Uh, To the believers in word, that is in your usual conversations, uh, as well as public speech, in the conduct, the way you handle yourself, in charity, in your, you know, manner of living, we're to be charitable to each other. Amen. You know. Uh, and uh, in spirit, you know, it's real easy to detect a wrong spirit. Uh, in faith, Uh, That is in your attitude toward the work of the Lord. In uh, uh, purity, right living, right living, and setting the right example. Now listen, give attendance to reading, Paul said. That means give special attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Now, the Bible tells us this. Now, this is not a statement out of the Bible, but this is my statement. Church doctrine is the foundation for spiritual worship and the power of the gospel. Church doctrine. I've heard a lot of people say, I don't like that old doctrine. You know, if it wasn't for the doctrine, there wouldn't have been no reason for the rest of it. Now, after stating the qualifications for Bishop Dickens, Paul expressed his desire to visit with Timothy. He said, I hope to come unto you shortly. Don't know whether I'll get to or not, but if I don't get to, got some uh, some uh, uh, advice for you that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the pillar and the ground of the truth. There's a right way. And there's a wrong way. It seems to me that the most important duty of a pastor is to maintain a church that is doctrinally sound and spiritually healthy. Spiritually healthy. Now here's why. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. That's why you need to keep preaching doctrine. Is it? And then he said, Beloved, when I gave, this is Jew, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, uh, he said, it was needful for you that I write and exhort you to earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints. And then it says, Evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And this is what he said to Timothy. But thou, continue thou in all things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And he said, from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures. That's able to make you wise. Now, Paul instructed Timothy, watch in all things. 
endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. Uh, in addition to teaching the Word of God, and I just throw this in, and but I think this is important. And you, brother and young brother, and I told you I'm trying to teach you how to be a good pastor. A good pastor. Well, you know, the cry, we're hearing the cry from all four quarters of the earth. Our churches are going down. Our churches are going down. You know what? It'll bring them back. Good, sound, spiritual preaching. Amen. Now, people will come to hear the Word of God where the, at, there's some meat in it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Storytelling, people don't care nothing about it. I don't care a thing about it. So, listen. If you show your church, now this is a quote from Brother Willie Taylor. He was my pastor when I was ordained. And there's a bunch of us young preachers at Bethel at that time. And we would have special Bible studies and Brother Willie would teach us young preachers. And he said, this is the advice he gave us. He said, now you show the church that you love them and that you care for them. You're concerned about them. You want the best for them. You let them know that, and they'll put up with poor preaching. <laughs> let that sink in. Ain't that the truth? Yes, sir. That's the truth. Evangelist, pre evangelistic preaching and sharing the gospel is so very important. I love it. I love to do evangelistic preaching. I love it because... It provides information to lost people about how to get saved. Amen. That's why it's important. I want to conclude. Let's see, I got two minutes and two seconds. I don't want to get in debt here. <laughs> Jesus, he uh, told his disciples, and especially Peter, in the, the 10th chapter, John, about the good shepherd. You know, I'm the door, he said. You know, I'm the good shepherd. Uh, he said, I, I give them eternal life. So the harlan won't do that. So the hireling don't care nothing about the sheep. You know what? A hireling is a man that's in it for the money. He don't care nothing about the sheep. When problem comes, he runs. Don't care. Oh, but listen, Jesus cares. Amen. Jesus cares. He said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, oh, Lord, you know I love you. He said, I want you to feed my lambs. Now, A.T. Robertson said that means, that phrase there, feed my lambs, means feed them like a shepherd. Give them nourishment. God's people needs nourishment. Then he goes on down, he asked him two more times. And that time it's a little different uh, in the Greek. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to give you this. And he said, Yea, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, Feed my sheep. And there it means feed them uh, like a 
shepherd or tend to them. Tend to my sheep like a shepherd. You tend to them. What, take care of their needs. Then when Peter got old, this is my last sentence. When Peter got older, he wrote this in one of his epistles. And he said, the elders which are among you, I exhort. I got some information for you. I'm going to share with you. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Take the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, not because you have to, but because you want to. Because you love them. And he said, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre. I can tell you a couple of stories that might make your hair stand up. But I won't do it. He said, uh, not for filthy lucre, that's money or its equivalent, but of a ready mind, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, <laughs> he's, coming, he's coming back. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that will not fade away. God bless you. I love you. I hope you don't think I was mean today. I'm not. I love you. But I love Jesus better. Amen. Thank you for listening to me. I hope God will bless your ministry, your churches. Oh, I'd like to see some old-time revivals. The people seeking the Lord. You pray for me, Brother Hicks.